Welcome to this video. This is yet another video featuring one of my games from the Bad Wiese Open Tournament, the Open Bavarian Championships. Yeah, this is round seven. And um, after six rounds, I had 4.5 points. Yeah, losing one game against Lendemann and conceding a draw to number one seed uh, Melkumian. So not a bad tournament. I beat all the all the rating wise weaker players and um, yeah still there were no chances left to score grandmaster norm the only thing left was trying for one of the the main prizes um, and this um, basically means that you need seven points okay quick calculation three rounds left means two and a half points out of three is the the goal um, at least 2.5 two and a half points, but well, three out of three is a little bit optimistic. So in round seven, I got white against a Bavarian Fiedem master, Ludwig Degelmann, a pretty dangerous player. He had beaten um, Grandmaster Delchev, very strong 2600 GM earlier in the tournament. And I had white, so it was clear, this is one of those games that you basically need to win if you want one of the main prizes. So let's see what happens. I played d4, and uh, the reason for that is um, that I saw my opponent plays the Dutch defense quite often. Somehow the Dutch defense or f4 played an important role in this tournament. Yeah, um, and I wanted to play after f5. He didn't do that, but um, I wanted to go knight c3 as um, I did in my game in round two. So this is why I started d4 and not knight f3 to get this specific line. However, he played knight f6. Okay, not a surprise. He had done this before, c4. And now he played knight to c6. Okay, this was a surprise. This um, opening, the, the two knights, tango or black knights, tango uh, defense, um, did not yet um, happen in his games. I learned uh, later that he had played it in one of the earlier rounds, but it wasn't a game that was um, in the Bouillette or in any way available to me, so it really came as a surprise. Uh, however, um, I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really... Um, um, yeah, upset or, or irritated because I have some knowledge um, because I have played this opening myself as black. And um, there's in fact one possibility that I gladly took now. Played knight f3, e6, this is how black is um, playing, and knight c3. Yeah, knight c3 basically forces black to play bishop to b4. And after queen c2, yeah, bishop to b4 is forced because I'm threatening e4. He cannot allow that, so bishop b4. And now queen c2. Yeah, and what we have now is we have a, a Zurich, <laughs> Zurich line of the classical Nimzo. Yeah, what I'm talking about is the normal move order is like that. Queen c2, knight c6, knight f3. And uh, if you watch my blitz games sometimes or regularly, you know that this is what I do as black against uh, the Nimzo and also <laughs> a line featured in my book. So I didn't mind to play this as white. Um, I have some knowledge about it, obviously. So why not play it with the white pieces? And it's uh, the kind of position that you get um, that you can easily play from both sides. It's just complex and interesting. Okay, and also my suspicion was that he is new to the opening and probably will not know all the uh, details. And this, in fact, turned out to be true. d6, bishop g5, h6, bishop d2. Yeah, this looks a bit curious. Why bishop g5 and after h6 um, drop back? Yeah, black really cannot do without h6 in the long run. This pin is, is annoying. And um, it is a case where after h6, um, white cannot really play this as this is blundering a pawn on e4. So I have to go back. But why would white lose a tempo like that? It is in fact um, an, an advantage for white to have the pawn on h6. Why will become apparent um, in the course of the game. It is, however, a pretty subtle point that um, 
is not very often recognized in, in chess literature or, or comments on games. But we will see um, we'll see why h6 is something that white uh, likes to see. Yeah, castles with a3 takes takes queen e7. Yeah, what black is doing is he's going for e5. A pretty common uh, strategy. Uh, if you have seen my game against Lendemann in round six, you will uh, notice that black setup is pretty much identical. Uh, simple, it's very similar to what I had against Lendemann. We only had a different minor beast distribution, but black's plan is essentially the same. You trade the dark squared bishop and then set up e5 to get a good bishop from a structural point of view. Yeah, I now went b4, expanding on the on the queen side, and he played e5, d5, knight to b8, and e4. Yeah, this is what I believe to be the most um, testing line for white against this opening. It is um, basically the, the main line of my section in the upcoming book on the Zurich defense on the NIM. So yeah, and um, actually my main move here that I will recommend in my book, I can tell you this right away, is a5. Yeah, setting up some counterplay on the queen side. Oh, well, counterplay is maybe the wrong word, but it is a, a way to activate the rook on a8, which is, some, is a little bit stuck, this rook. And with a5, you get, um, yeah, you make sure that it has some use. Um, however, he didn't play that. He played the move knight h5. And this is, in a way, <clears throat> the most natural move in the position because black wants counterplay f5. Black <clears throat> needs some sort of pawn break. If he is uh, just sitting around and is doing nothing, he will be worse because of the space um, disadvantage. Um, and the breaks that he has are b5, very unlikely to manage, sometimes possible, c6, and f5. Yeah, f5 is the most obvious one and very often the, the right idea. In fact, the move knight h5 is the move that is played mostly and uh, justifiably so in the same position with the pawn back on h7. The reason why it is not so good here is the move g3. And um, the, the big problem is that now black cannot play f5. After f5, I play knight h4. And here we see the big point of white provoking h6. Yeah, I know it has been eight moves <laughs> ago that uh, this uh, provocation happened, but this is really the big subtle point. Now f5 is uh, a lot more difficult to achieve and in this case even impossible. If we look at something like this, for example, after e takes, bishop takes, knight takes, and this whole line of trades, white in fact already wins with the move f4. Yeah, pretty, pretty funny move after the capture, there's g4 winning a piece. Note that the immediate g4 can be answered by rook f3. Funny counterattack. Yeah, um, this is a line that, that, that I knew, of course, because I had invested uh, hours uh, for my book. But the problem for him was he had to find all that over the board. And by this point, g3, we had a funny situation in terms of clock times. We uh, had this 90 minutes as a starting, uh, starting time and then 30 second increment. And at this point, I had 95 minutes on my clock, so I gained five minutes because I could basically blitz all the moves. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I know I, I knew what I was doing, and he had to basically reinvent the wheel over the board. And um, he was down to 25 minutes by this point, or 30 minutes. I don't write down the clock times normally, but it was something like that. A very, um, a very clear. Um, advantage in time that I had. After longer consideration, he came up with a5, which is, I think, a pretty good solution. And um, it's quite comparable to my a5 suggestion one move earlier. Basically, in the game, what he gets is a slightly worse version of my, my analysis, where the moves g3 and knight h5 are not played. Um, frankly, this is not happening, helping him a lot, the knight on h5, because he can never play f5. 
and um, yeah, th therefore it's a slightly uh, slightly worse version of um, of what I think is is best for black. However, it is not that terrible. Black's position is still fairly solid. In fact, my next move is probably not so precise. I now played the move bishop to e2, um, intending to go knight h4 using this offside position of the knight. Um, I underestimated the upcoming sequence, to be honest, um, and especially uh, one, one line. Um, I think with hindsight it was better to play bishop g2 and uh, make sure that bishop h3 is not coming. After that we probably get something like this. And um, from here we, we continue with I don't know, knight a6, the, this kind of line, um, with white maybe being a little bit better. After bishop g4 I go to d2, not allowing any trades. And again, he cannot play f5 due to his uh, somewhat weird piece construction here. Um, this is what I should have done. However, I played bishop e2 and um, will show you what I had uh, yeah, misjudged in a way. He now took, took on a1 and played bishop h3. Kind of normal in this, um, in this line. Yeah, the thing is, what I did not really appreciate much is the following sequence. Knight h4, this is what I played and is right. This is the right continuation. Knight f4. A funny reply, but the only one that uh, that really makes any sense. And here I originally thought that bishop f1 would be quite nice. Yeah, the idea is that if he now takes, I get in knight f5 with a with a nice position. However, what I did not really appreciate beforehand is that well, he does not need to take. He can also just play a, a developing move like knight d7. And after that, we have a really weird construction on the king's side. <laughs> I don't want to take on f4, damaging my structure. And I really don't know what kind of useful moves I should play. I can play the bishop over here, but he also has rook a8 with a, with a useful idea to invade on the a-file. Very difficult to get my rook into play here. And uh, something like that, um, yeah, I mean, still, <laughs> I cannot cancel. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I was really irritated that uh, this wasn't working. So I went with bishop f3, which is not bad. I mean, I'm not saying uh, white is worse or anything, but I really thought um, I should get some advantage out of the opening. But it's not, uh, it's not really the case. If he um, continues precisely, black is still quite okay. He now went to g6 and I played knight f5. The reason why black is um, quite playable is simply the out of play rook here. Yeah, the bishop here controlling this means I have a hard time to castle and get the rook into play. Yeah, he went to d7. I was more expecting queen d8, but it's not, not really bad. And um, yeah, played bishop c3. Yeah. The, pos the whole position, I mean, looks nice for white. I have more space, I have two bishops, but still, without the rook, it's difficult. And he played it well. He played c6, which is a good idea. You need to open uh, the position a bit as black, getting some counterplay here on the c-file. Yeah, um, here I played knight e3. I think this is the best move. Taking on c6, this kind of thing, it uh, looks interesting at first because of the pressure on d6, but black has interesting counterplay by means of knight d4. Something like that, for example, is uh, totally unclear. I'm still playing without my king. Yeah, I think bishop, um, uh, sorry, knight e3 is what I played is, is I think a good move. The knight is not doing that much um, on f5 um, anyway. And after knight e3, I had envisioned this structural change already. He um, took here, and uh, now I have knight c4 as a possibility in the future. Yeah, rook c8, this is all, I think, very uh, 
logical. Yeah, here you can maybe debate what white should do, but I think my move king d2 is quite quite okay. I need to get the rook into the game. And uh, well, the king on d2 is, is a safe piece. Yeah, and here he went knight a6, played queen d3, yeah, b4 was hanging, so. And he went knight e7. I think this is all logical from both sides. And uh, it's uh, while you can suggest other things, it's not uh, something that you um, can uh, criticize much. I played bishop e2. Also, I think a good move, getting this bishop on a better diagonal and um, helping to prepare moves like knight c4 or also queen b5. Queen b5. Note that one thing I, in my favor is that in a possible endgame where queens are traded, my king is already active and near the queen side, maybe ready to join. Oops, I didn't want to play h5 here. <laughs> and he, of course, didn't play it in the game. Um, yeah, ready to join the action on the queen side. Yeah, he now played the move f5. Uh, maybe this is questionable and he should try to um, improve his, his pieces a little bit more. But um, I, I totally understand that he finally wants to get in this break and he's an active player. He does not want to just sit and wait. However, it seems that here White has a pretty good continuation. In fact, I saw the move, but I couldn't really... Yeah... It wasn't clear to me. Um, I played f3 in the end, uh, but f4, f4 is the move that I saw, but I wasn't sure about. It is a very logical move because it, it opens up my bishop here, but I wasn't sure because I thought that this line here, this and knight f5, yeah, I, I probably have to trade, takes, queen d4, Rook c7, rook g1. I had seen this position and I was thinking, okay, it looks like I should be better. I mean, this and this, it, it all looks nice, but he has g7 defended. And, well, my pawn structure is not great. I only have four pawns left and they're all isolated. And I wasn't really sure um, if this is so great. I mean, I was thinking maybe he can defend g7 and get his knight improved and, hmm... How exactly do I improve from here? I mean, probably white is just a little bit better in any case due to the two bishops, but um, yeah, I'm still unsure if I should have done that, to be honest. Uh, well, I think my f3 move is not bad, but it is somewhat it is somewhat undecisive, you know? It's a little bit of a half move. Um, yeah, he now played knight c7, which is good. And I played rook a1. Yeah, my rook finally into play with the idea to maybe use it on a7. And <clears throat> I think the next move now is um, is a real mistake. Up to this point, I think he played well. Um, he now played rook a8. What needs to be uh, mentioned is that at this point, I, I still had almost an hour left on the clock. I had a huge advantage on the clock. And he was down to just a couple of minutes. And this is really an important factor to have this pressure on the clock. Um, yeah, well, rook a8 was his move, trying to trade my, my active looking rook on a1. Um, this, however, has a, has a direct uh, drawback. What he should do is to take on e4, f takes, knight e8, intending knight f6. And after that, I think that black has... Um, reached a position where he can be reasonably um, satisfied. Um, I still think that white is a very, a very little better because I have ideas to play against the d6 pawn, but we have a position where there are no pawn breaks left, which favors the knights in general, and he had, does not have any bad pieces there, like a dark squared bishop would be awful on f8 or something. So uh, this is um, okay. Yeah, I didn't I, I didn't mind to play this position as white, but um, it should be uh, should be playable for black, and at best be a little bit worse. Um, yeah, he went with rook a8, but this is really a mistake. 
And the reason is the following. I can take, um, and I did take, knight takes, and here white has a choice. I still have f4 for, for good play, but I also have g4, and this is what I played. This is now um, hitting black in a very unlucky moment, this g4 move. It isolates the bishop, and this is a big problem. The bishop is offside. This idea always was in the position for the last couple of moves, but now with the knight being on a8, this is especially problematic. Um, now he only has one continuation, and this is also what I thought in the in the game. He has to take on g4 now. It's absolutely the only move. Something like this is really almost losing the bishop on the long run. Very, very difficult to play, if at all. Yeah, he should take. And I recapture. And now my idea is to play knight f5. Yeah, with a discovered attack on the bishop. Black still can uh, can play this, but it is uh, it's very tough, very tough to defend. Um, the point is that I play... I should play this to play knight f4. And now after knight f5, bishop g2, um, I have to move queen b5. I, I had seen this in the game um, and thought that, okay, white is better here. How much is hard to tell. Um, the reason why white is better is that something like this wins the d6 pawn. And we get a, get a very open position now. Something like bishop d5, bishop b3. Knight has to move, and after bishop b1, I will take on e5 next. And here we have a position where white has the bishop pair in a wide open situation. My king is better, and his king is still on g8. A very, very uncomfortable position for black to defend. Yeah, I, I think that that's very tough to play. Very tough to play. Um, this is just one possibility, but um, I had seen the start of this line and thought, okay, well, this is nice. Let's go for it. However, after g4, we jump back to the key position here. Um, as mentioned, he didn't have much time. And uh, with just a couple of minutes left on the clock, he took on e4. Um, I think this is just something of a blackout. Um, I think he basically thought that um, it was uh, it doesn't didn't matter much how he takes as I recapture with the pawn. However, after f takes e4, I have the additional idea to take with the queen, and this is much much better in comparison to have the queen on e4. Yeah, this position is really directly lost for Black. I mean, like totally lost. He has uh, absolutely no defense against the dual ideas of bishop d3 and queen h7 and f4, which opens up here, and then queen f3. Well, this is very, very colorful. Um, let's have a look at, at the variation. He went knight b6, yeah? But let's say he plays a move like this. Then I have this idea, and now queen g3 or queen f3 basically wins the bishop. It is trapped. And after f4, also note that this long diagonal opens up. Yeah, he, he played in the game. He played knight to b6. <clears throat> played bishop d3, threatening to enter here with decisive effect. So g6. And now I played f4. And uh, yeah, this position is uh, is like, it's, it's totally winning for white. And uh, I was a bit surprised still that he uh, already resigned here. It is justified, but still I expected some sort of move to be played. Um, it is, however, impossible to find something that uh, is even remotely playable. For example, after bishop takes g4, I take on e5. And after bishop f5, queen d4, white wins on the long diagonal. Like this, for example. And this is going to be a checkmate soon. Yeah, after f4, as mentioned, he um, he resigned. There is really no playable move. I was very surprised how quickly this went. Uh, this went um, downhill after the f takes e4 capture. But this is what very often happens in in games where there is not that much happening. But when there is a huge clock um, disadvantage for one side. Very often you don't have the time to um, to 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 think about the subtle points, 
And sometimes you overlook those simple things where you think, okay, yeah, let, let's just take there. And it's not, um, you don't have the time to check and you think, okay, it doesn't matter. I just take here, whatever. And um, then you all of a sudden recognize, oh no, he can take with the queen. So it's something that um, can uh, can easily happen. Yeah, I think it was an interesting, an interesting game where he... Um, defended uh, very well after this uh, problem in the opening where he had this huge um, disadvantage on the clock on um, a position like like here or after um, after the capture on e4 with 98 is definitely okay for black but at the end um, the the time problem really um, was was very much uh, very much important and this netted me a win. So um, a very nice win in this round seven, keeping me in contention for uh, one of the main prizes. Uh, by the way, we're not talking about <laughs> about uh, huge sums of money here, but uh, if we, um, something like seven points probably nets you like three or 400 euros if things uh, go well. Okay, yeah, thanks for watching this game. I hope you enjoyed it.